Welcome to the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham. Got any comments? Send them to me, box13 at greatdetectors.net. Cast your vote for the show on Podcast Alley, podcastalley.greatdetectors.net. And uh, become a fan on Facebook, facebook.greatdetectives.net. And we begin, actually, with an iTunes review. Uh, uh, This one is from Junie, who writes, I haven't listened to all these shows so far, just... Pat Novak, which I love, just wish so many hadn't been lost. Sherlock Holmes, love the show. Hate the Petri One ads. I mean, I like when the guy's talking to Watson, but please edit out the ads in the middle of shows, and not just for Holmes. Box 13. Again, nice. And Johnny Dollar, which I wasn't wild about, but it was still cool. I haven't listened to Let George Do It yet, but I'm planning on doing it uh, soon. I also love the Rathbone Bruce movie. Please put up uh, more of them. Uh, well, thanks for the comments. Uh, we're, we've got actual, uh, of course, I've mentioned that we're going to be doing the bath um, coming up uh, coming up this Sunday. Uh, but we are going to do the ra- uh, we're going to do three more of the Rathbone Bruce movies. Those are the ones that made it into the public domain. Um, in, in terms of the ads in the middle of the show, I, I've kind of gone back and forth on this, and I'm basically at the point of if it an, if the ads annoy me, that's when I'll pull them. I haven't quite gotten there with the Petri wine, and I know some. Pe- I, I don't know. We we've gotten a, a few more comments in favor than against the Petri wine ads. Um, so until I get to the point of annoyance, uh, we're going to go ahead and keep them in. So, but thanks for the comment, much appreciated, and uh, thanks for your support o- over on iTunes. All right, well, before we get into the show, I do want to let you know uh, about Netflix. Uh, for Sherlock Holmes fans, I think Netflix has got to be uh, a top resource. Because, uh, as I mentioned, there are four of the Rathbone Bruce uh, Sherlock Holmes movies that are in the uh, public domain. The other ten, um, you can uh, can actually be ordered. You can watch it, uh, enjoy it, and then send it back or uh, through Netflix. Uh, and you can also enjoy Jeremy Brett's fine BBC uh, version. Uh, Netflix allows you to access the best in Sherlock Ho- Sherlock's Holmes movies. Um, and just be able to get as much homes on TV as you'd like. Uh, sign up for Netflix. Uh, you get a couple weeks free. Uh, go to greatdetectors.net, click on the Netflix banner. And now uh, we turn to today's show. This one is called The Unfortunate Tobacconist. And uh, I will go ahead and let you know what's going on in the world, because it will be discussed briefly at the end of the show. It's April 30th of 1945, uh, in Europe, the Allies are closing in um, on the uh, Axis powers. And actually, uh, on April 30th, uh, this is the same day that Hitler ended his own life um, and really signaled that uh, victory in Europe was at hand. So let's go ahead and we will get into the unfortunate tobacconist, and then we'll come back. This episode from the life of Sherlock Holmes will be transmitted to our men and women overseas by shortwave and through the worldwide facilities of the Armed Forces Radio Service. Petri Wine brings you... Basil Rathbone and Nigel Bruce in the new adventures of Sherlock Holmes. The Petri family, the family that took time to bring you good wine, invites you to listen to Dr. Watson tell us about another exciting adventure he shared with his old friend, that master detective, Sherlock Holmes. It began on a, on a, on a summer evening in 1906. I'd been for a long walk in the park. I remember when I returned to Baker Street and entered our rooms, Holmes looked up at me with a twinkle and, uh, and spoke. You look positively glowing with health, Watson. Well, I had a splendid walk, my dear fellow. You should have come with me. The park was looking particularly beautiful. Well, chap, during our absence, I've decided to write another monograph. 
Oh, well, what's the subject this time? Occupational liability to murder. For instance, the mortality rate is naturally high among policemen and detectives. Physicians are murdered with fair regularity, but the murder of a dentist is rare. And who ever heard of a murdered veterinary surgeon? That's quite true, but what's the occasion for this little homily? I've been browsing over my newspaper clippings. Yeah? You recall ever hearing of a murdered tobacconist, Watson? No, no, I can't say that I do. Oh, I... And yet my clippings inform me that no less than three tobacconists have been murdered in the past six months and all the murders have occurred in the same small shop at the east end of London. Now, why do you suppose three tobacconists would be murdered in the same shop? Come now, fellow. Give me a logical solution to the problem, will you? Well, uh, let me see. You say that the shop's in the, in the east end? Yes. Is it near the river? As it happens, it's on the water's edge. Then supposing the tobacconist shop was the headquarters of a smuggling ring... Perhaps boxes of cigars were unloaded from the dock and mm. brought to the shop. Cigars containing pearls or opium or something. Watson, my dear fellow, you're doing splendidly. Oh, you must walk in the park more frequently. You're positively scintillating. Oh, now no, you're, no, you're making fun of me. I'm sure you're not. You're expecting anyone home? No, no, probably a visitor from Mrs. Hudson. Go on with your fascinating theory. Now, why are three tobacconists murdered? Well, because they, they know too much. Perhaps they demand a share of the profits... So the head of the ring decides to kill him. Plausible enough, Watson. I really must congratulate you. Oh, I can see that I'm very lucky in having a biographer with such a lively oh, imagination. Thanks very much. Come in. <laughs> imagination. Oh. Oh, hello, Mr. Stroud. Ah, I'm glad to see you. Uh, I hope I'm not intruding. Not at all, my dear fellow. Come along, sit down. Uh, thank you, Miss Holmes. Anything uh, remarkable on hand? No, no, Miss Holmes. Nothing very uh, particular. Ah. Then tell me all about it, Mr. Stroud. <laughs> Can't hide anything from you, can I, sir? Yes, there is something on my mind, and no mistake. And it concerns the three murdered tobacconists, I see. Splendid. Now, how the blazes did you know that? Yes, it sounds like pure magic. Not at all, Maddie Watson. It's simple deduction. deduction. Observe the five oh, cigars peering out of Lestrade's breast pocket. They are of a far superior quality to his usual brand. Obviously, the scene of his latest investigation has profit certain well, shall we say, uh, Professional perquisites? Am I right, Lestad? <laughs> of course you are. Careful one, Mr. Holmes. Thank you, Ross. My pipe. Well, how about you, Doctor? Oh, thank you, Lestad. Thank you. Coronas. And now, Inspector, tell me about the murdered tobacconist. Well, how much do you know about the case? Oh, just what I've read in the papers. Well, curiously enough, we were discussing the affair as you walked in, Lestad. Eh, it's a strange business, gentlemen. I only got hold of the old story today when I had a long talk to young Jack Longworth. Uh, he's the owner of the show. Well, in relation to uh, Gerald Longworth, the taller member of Parliament who battled so successfully against the slum clearance bill? His son, Mr. Holmes. Oh, what's a nice young fellow, too. Uh, when his father died, he inherited this shop along with a lot of other property in the East End. Well, uh, how big a shop is it, Mr. Holmes? Ward sold in the wall, Doctor. Like all the other shops in that part of London, the young Mr. Longworth... Tells me he first rents it to a man by the name of George Grillet. He lives there with his daughter, Lily, and made it quite a nice go out of the shop. Six months ago, when Jack Longworth was abroad, George Grillet has a stroke and nearly kicks the bucket. Kicks the, uh, kicks the what? He nearly dies, Doctor. Oh, it kicks the bucket. <laughs> I don't remember that. And then what happened to Stroud? <laughs> well, while he's in the hospital, his daughter gives up the lease on the shop. A few days later, an Italian takes it over, and a couple of weeks later, he's found with his float cut. Did you investigate that first murder yourself? No, Miss Holmes. It seemed like any of a dozen killings we get in that part of London. A shopkeeper cut up, his till emptied, no clues. Well, who was the next tenant? A Scotchman, bloke by the name of Mackintosh. A few weeks after he moved in, the same thing happened to him. That time, I did go down there, but I couldn't find out nothing. Was robbery again the apparent murder? Yes, sir. But the killing one the same. He was strangled with a silk scarf. Silk scarf, eh? And who was the third tenant? The man who was murdered yesterday? A Hindu fellow. A man by the name of Mukherjee. He takes it over a week last Friday, and yesterday we find him knife through the back and his money gone. Of course, I was down there eh, before you could say Crystal Palace. But once again, I didn't find out nothing. No knife, no fingerprints on the till, no footprints... Just a very dead Hindu. Was young Mr. Longworth a landlord in England when these murders occurred? Yeah, that's the funny thing about it, Mr. Holmes. He docked Tilbury yesterday morning. He didn't know nothing about what had been going on. Well, I imagine he'd have difficulty in renting the shop after three murders. Well, that's just it, Doctor. That's why he comes to me at the yard. 
George Grinnett, his first tenant of the shop, moved back there today with his daughter Lily. And young Mr. Longworth worried about them. <laughs> well, if you ask me, he's more worried about the daughter than he is about old man Grinnett. So the original tenants of the shop are back in residence again, eh? And, um, uh, what do you want me to do? Well, I thought perhaps you'd be interested enough to come along with me and look at the shop, Mr. Evans. I should be very glad to, my dear fellow. Let's go. That Watson. Oh, dear. Oh, dear. That wretched instrument. I'll answer it. Hello? Mike Grant, how are you? What? Yes. Yes, he... He's here now. Why, of course. I'll do everything I can, certainly. Let's have dinner together soon, shall we? Splendid idea. All right, goodbye. Well, is that your brother, home? Yes. To start, I do think you might have told me the whole truth. What do you mean, sir? I thought your visit was prompted by a... Need for friendly assistance. I didn't realize that you came here virtually on a government order. Well, it wasn't just quite like that, Mr. Holmes. What's the government got to do with the case? And how does your brother Mycroft fit into the picture? Not eh? sure yet. But of one thing we make certain, there's obviously a great deal more in this case than Lestrade would have us believe. Why do you say that, Holmes? You must bear in mind, old fellow, that occasionally Mycroft is British government. <laughs> part of London take a walk in on a foggy night, ain't it, gentlemen? <laughs> All our policemen work down here in pairs, you know. Yes, I don't blame them. It's a vile neighborhood. Uh, there's the shop just ahead of us, with a sign hanging out. Hello, hello, there he is again. Oh. See that bearded Hindu skulking off around the corner there? Oh, yes. He's been haunting the place ever since I came down here. So a bearded Hindu haunts the place, eh? Yes, and yesterday, Holmes, the Hindu proprietor of the shop was murdered. Exactly. Well, here we are. I'll go in first. Press of his place, sir. Huh? I'll be at it, Jimmy. That's Lily, George Grit's daughter. Helps him with the shop. Sorry to keep you wet. Oh, Oh, it's you, Inspector Lestrade. Yes, Miss Lee. Uh, I brought some gentlemen to see your father. Uh, this is Mr. Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson. Pleased to meet you, I'm sure. How do you do, Miss Grit? Uh, how do you do, young lady? Is your dad home? No, Inspector. He won't be in till after dinner. Went down at the docks, he did, to see about some cigar shipments. Mr. Longworth's here. If you want to see him, we were just having some tea in the back room. Yes, oh, I like these gentlemen to meet him. Jack, come out in the shop, Jack. What is it, Lily? Oh, Inspector Lestrade. And this must be Mr. Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson, I'm sure. How do you do, sir? How are you, Mr. Longworth? I'm very glad the inspector was able to persuade you to come down here, Mr. Holmes. I'm dreadfully worried about this business, particularly since Lily's father insisted on coming back here. I'm afraid they're in great danger, but I can't make Mr. Grillet see it. Young lady, I wonder if I might ask you a few questions. Well, of course, Mr. Holmes. Before your father had his stroke, did he receive any threats concerning his occupancy of the shop? Well, if he did, he never told me about him. But it wouldn't surprise me. I often told him his biggest enemy is himself, if you know what I mean. Yes, I think I do, Miss Grillet. When your father had his illness, who decided to give up the lease on the shop? I did. No money was coming in, and, well, it looked like Dad might be an invalid for life. Mm. Of course, I couldn't run the shop by myself. Anyhow, I never did like this part of London. It wasn't the right business for Father. Uh, what was his reaction when you told him... Uh... You've given up the lease. Oh, he was awful angry with me. Said I have a right to do it without asking him. Uh, by the way, uh, we saw that bearded Hindu again as we walked up just now. He's been hanging around ever since we came back here, Inspector. Well, has he actually come into the shop, Miss Grit? No, but he keeps walking by and looking in the window. I'm sure if we both went into the back room or left the shop for a little while, well, he'd come right in. Then I suggest we give him the opportunity he's seeking. Miss Grillet, I wonder if you and Mr. Longworth would mind leaving the shop for a while. Of course not, Mr. Holmes. Make your departure rather ostentatious, shall we say, so that he can't help noticing it. Give us half an hour or so and then come back. Perhaps you wouldn't mind going with him, Mr. Rod. But, Mr. Holmes, this is my case. I know, I know, but um, in a situation like this, Watson and I work much better alone. We may have to go a little outside the law, and your presence might embarrass us. <laughs> You'd never think I was a detective, too, would you? Anyway, we'll be back in half an hour. <laughs> poor, poor old Estrade. He gets very touchy as the years roll by. Yeah, I blame him. I'm leaving him completely in the dark. Come on, Watson. 
Behind the counter. No, 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 no. My oh. dear fellow, not oh. under it. Not under it, old chap. We lift the flap. So. Ah, now it's just to be crouched down behind here. Come on. That's it. Have you got your revolver, Watson? Yes, it's in my pocket. Good. In the meantime, make yourself as comfortable as these cramped quarters will permit. We may have uh, quite a wait ahead of us. Look, look, Holmes. There's the Hindu now, peering through the window. Revolver handy. Yes, yes, sir. Here, here he comes. All right, Watson. Put your hands up. I got you covered with this revolver. Now, my man, what are you doing here? Who? Who are you? Never mind who I am. Just answer my question. I do not speak. Very good English. To Hindustani Patrol Inspector? Ah, Sector Hai. You to Ida Aya? Dekni Kosti, Tumara Bai, Homko, who come here? Tumara Bai! Tumjan Sector. But that's a. Dala! No, 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 you don't, my man. Just you stay where you are. It's all right, Watson. Let go. He's on our side. I wish you'd tell me what in thunder's going on. Who that man was and why you let him go. He's an investigator from the Foreign Office, old chap. Given his instructions by my brother, Mycroft. Mycroft? Yes, old fellow. When my brother fails to tell me all the facts concerning this case, I begin to think these triple murders have far greater ramifications than we ever dreamed of. Dr. Watson's story will continue in just a second. Just about time enough for me to mention that any meal becomes a better meal when you serve it with Petri wine. And say, you'll find that Petri California Burgundy and Petri California Sauterne are just made to go with food. That Petri Burgundy is a rich red wine that's bosom pals with any meat or meat dish. Boy, what a flavor. And that Petri Sauterne is the delicate white wine that's just perfect with chicken or with fish. Yes, sir, with food, you just can't beat a good Petri wine. Now back to tonight's new Sherlock Holmes adventure. Puzzling case is occupying the attention of Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson. Three murders have taken place in a small tobacconist shop in the east end of London. As we rejoin our story, it's late at night, and Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson, accompanied by Inspector Lestrade, are once again walking toward the ill-fated shop. Well, I don't see that you've accomplished much, Mr. Holmes, except that you just bought me a nice dinner. Oh, I'm making progress, Lestrade. If only by the elimination of obvious suspects. But there's a pattern to this case that should give us a clue. Well, how do you mean, Holmes? My dear fellow, consider the obvious motive of these murders and particularly observe the results they've obtained. Well, the murders are the same in all three killings. Robbery. Oh, no, sir. Not the theft of a few pounds from the till. Blind you to the real motive. Look, 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 look. Here's Miss Credit now. He's coming out of the shop. Good evening, Miss Credit. Hello, Mr. Holmes. Is your father home yet? Yes, he is, Mr. Holmes. Well, I can't tell you how anxious I am for you to talk to him. I'm going to meet Mr. Longwear. He's taken me to the music hall. I should be on just after ten. I hope you'll be able to stay with Dad until then. Well, don't you worry, Miss Grit. We'll keep an eye on him. Oh, thanks ever so much. Oh, um... Oh, Mr. Holmes. Yes, Miss Grit? Please don't go into our rooms in the back, will you? I've left things in a frightful mess. I quite understand, Miss Grit. Well, ta-ta. See you later. Let's go into the shop. Who is it? Oh, oh, it's you, Inspector. Here, yeah, these gentlemen, uh, Mr. Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson. Oh, good, evening, sir. Uh, good evening, sir. Uh, good evening. Did you meet young Lily just now? Yes, she uh, told us she was going out to the music hall with Mr. Longworth. Yes. I'm afraid we had quite a set to about that. A uh, very strong-willed girl, Lily, very strong-willed. Might I to assume that uh, you disapprove of your daughter's association with Mr. Longworth? Ah, uh, of course I do. He's a top. He's got lots of money. Lily's so blind she can't see that he's up to no good. Hmm. Uh, I'm pretty sure he's afraid I might find out what's really at the back of these here murders. And what is your theory, sir? Well, I'll tell you this in confidence. Got nothing to back it up, I understand. There's been talk of widening the docks around here. 
That'd make property values go up, you see, of course. Well, young Longworth's been trying to buy up all the other shops along the waterfront here, but they wouldn't sell. If you ask me, he's had these murders done just to frighten people away so that they, he could buy cheap. Now, I'm not saying that he did the murders himself, you understand, but he planned them. Why, in these parts, it's easy enough any night to get a throat cut for a couple of quid. Yeah. That's why I'm glad you're here, gents. You see, I... Uh, I just got another warning. Warning? What do you mean, it's a warning? Found this note slipped under that door there not three quarters of an hour ago. Let me see it, please. Huh. What does it say, Holmes? I shall call on you at 8.30 tonight. You know what's good for you. You'll be waiting for me alone. If you try any funny tricks, you'll go where I sent the rest of them. Well, that's obviously been the killer. Possibly. What's the time now? Mm, it's, uh, very past eight. I, uh, was hoping you gentlemen would wait in our rooms back of the shop. You can hear what's going on in here, and if he tries any rough stuff, you can pop in and have him. Just what I was about to suggest myself, Mr. Bredis. Either way, will you? Oh, yes. Just step behind the counter, gents. Now, through here. Ah, here we are. Not exactly Buckingham Palace back here. But you can make yourselves comfortable, can't you, gents? Oh, don't you worry about us, Quillen. Oh, I better turn up the gas. This bloke spots a light under the door in here. Might smell a rat. Now, there we are. Now, as soon as I see him coming in the shop, I'll knock twice on the door. Like this. And that'll give you the signal that he's here. Is that right? Right, you are, Grillet. All right, now keep your ears open, gents. I may need your help. Where are you, Holmes? I can't see a thing. Over here, Watson. You know, I've, I've got another theory why Jack Longworth might be at the back of all this. You listening, Holmes? Yes, I'm listening, Lord Fellow. What is your theory? Longworth knows that Grillet doesn't approve of his having anything to do with Lily. So when he goes abroad, he leaves instructions to murder the tobacconist. The assassins don't know about Grillet having a stroke, of course, so they keep murdering the, uh, the wrong fellow. Well, that makes very good sense, Doctor. <laughs> what do you say, Mr. Holmes? Holmes. Holmes. Where are you? That's my silly. He's disappeared. No, I haven't. I was just exploring. Shh. That's the signal. There goes the front door. Somebody's coming. Better go in. We've got to get in there at once. Open the door. Wait, it's locked. Never mind that. Get your soldiers into it. Come on. Come on, help me. Come on. Go. Come on, one more. Poor devil. He's been slashed with a knife. Fill it. Fill it. What, the killer got away? I'm going to... No, no, Lestrade can save your energy. Your murderer lies there. But that's grilly. Of course it is. Search his pockets, Watson. I think you'll find a bloodstained knife. Uh, let's have a look. Uh, good Lord. He has a razor in his pocket. It's covered with blood. You mean to say that he slashed himself? Let's set the handcuffs on him, Lestrade. While he's still play-acting, he may be more difficult to handle when he realizes the game's up. Take your hands off of me. Come on, quick. Come on, here. Yes. Hey. Come on. Oh, you're... Oh, you're... Oh, you're... Yeah. Very neat, Lestrade. Yeah. Well... Now that I've knocked a wounded man out cold, perhaps you'll tell me what's going on, Mr. Holmes. Yes, I'm completely in the dark, too. Oh, it's very simple, really. Willett has just staged a fake attack on himself. Fool us into believing that someone else is the murderer. Yeah, but the threatening note he received... Composed by himself for the occasion. Yes, but we heard voices. We heard the shop door open. He heard Grit talking to himself. And as for the shop door, that's how he gave himself away. Well, how do you mean, Mr. Holmes? Whenever the shop door opens, there's a bell that jangles. You will notice... Uh... Oh. Yeah, that's right, there is. There's no bell jangle when we were in the back room. But it got us in there, locked the door on us unobtrusively, and staged his little drama. Yes, but we heard the door creak open and close, Mr. O. The creak of this flap in the counter would sound exactly the same, my dear fellow. Now listen. Yes, but why, Holmes? How did you spot that Grillet was a man? It was obvious from the beginning that since nothing changed about the shop except the ownership, that the attackers were directed against any tobacconist who was not Grillet himself. Of course, his daughter, Lily, obviously knew what was going on. 
Well, I don't see how you figure that one out, Mr. Holmes. Every remark that she made showed that although she loved her father, she knew his failings. In any case, she gave me the final clue. Well, what clue was that? In very pointedly asking me not to go into the back room of the shop. Of course, she meant the reverse of what she said. I followed her advice when you were explaining your theory to Lestrade. Well, what did you find, Mr. Holmes? Miss Grillet had obligingly left a secret door open, a door leading to a passageway that seemed uh, to go down to the waterfront. We'll examine it more thoroughly in a minute. Yes, but I still don't understand Grillet's motive, Holmes. Neither do I, old chap. No, I suspect that from uh, the interest of the foreign office in the case, this shop has been the headquarters of, a, of an espionage ring. I'm afraid the final answer to that question will have to be given by someone else. Oh, who, Holmes? By my uh, elder brother, Mycroft. Humiliating, isn't it, Watson? And what was the final answer to the question, Dr. Watson? Well, well Holmes is right as usual, Mr. Foreman. The shop had been the headquarters of a spy ring operated by Grillet. And many international criminals had been smuggled in England... Foreign ships moored up the river. And did Mr. Grillet hang for his crime? No, 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 he didn't, my boy. Before the, he came to trial, he, he had another stroke and he died. Probably just as well for his daughter's sake. Oh, his daughter. <laughs> Lovely girl. Did she marry Longworth? <laughs> Indeed she did. As a matter of fact, I, I danced at her wedding. It was a very wonderful wedding reception. <laughs> See, you would have been there yourself, Mr. Foreman. In fact, you would have liked it very much. They, they served a pretty good wine. <laughs> Was it a Petri wine by any chance? Hmm? Oh, well, it was so good it easy it might have been. <laughs> <laughs> you mean because Petri wine is the kind of a wine you can't forget. That's exactly what I do well, mean. Well, that's because the Petri that's family the really knows it. all there is to know about the fine art of turning luscious, sun-ripened grapes into fragrant, delicious wine. You see, the Petri family's been making wine ever since they started the Petri business way back in the 1800s. And they've been able to hand on down in the family from father to son, from father to son, every bit of their skill and experience. That's why Petri wine is so good today. Because Petri took time to bring you good wine. And say, don't forget to take a moment yourself and send for your free recipe calendar. Remember, send to Petri wine. Petri wine, San Francisco 26, San Francisco 26, California. This offer is intended to apply only in those states and other localities where its acceptance is permissible by law and regulation. And now, Doctor, do you feel like giving us a hint about next week's story? Yes, I do. Next week, Mr. Foreman, I'm going to tell you a strange adventure that happened to Holmes and me in the West End of London. It concerns the death of a famous actor who was portraying the part of an equally famous man, Sherlock Holmes. Thank you, Doctor. See you next week. And say, from the news we've had so far today, maybe by next week at this time we'll hear some really good news from Europe. I certainly hope so, Mr. Foreman. But let us remember the war won't be over when Germany quits. We've still got to lick Japan. That's going to take a long time. So instead of celebrating when VE Day comes along, let's just strengthen our resolve to support the war more than ever here at home. Keep that war job. Don't leave it till you're released. Keep on buying more and more and more war bonds and, and keep them. Don't turn them in. Help all you can with all home front activities and observe all our wartime regulations such as price ceiling. That's the real way to celebrate a victory in Europe, by working harder to end the war in the Pacific. Tonight's Sherlock Holmes adventure is written by Dennis Green and Anthony Boucher and is based on an incident in the Sir Arthur Conan Doyle story, The Adventure of the Six Napoleons. Mr. Rathbone appears with the courtesy of Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer and Mr. Bruce with the courtesy of Universal Pictures, where they are now starring in the Sherlock Holmes series. The Petri Wine Company of San Francisco, California, invites you to tune in again next week, same time, same station. Meanwhile, don't forget to take advantage of our offer of a free recipe calendar. Oh, the Petri family took the time to bring you such good wine. So when you eat and when you cook, remember Petri wine. To make good food taste better, remember... Pet, pet, Petri. This is Bill Foreman saying good night for the Petri family. Sherlock Holmes comes to you from our Hollywood studios. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. Welcome back. Uh, Dr. Watson is uh, uh, giving out orders uh, for the war. Uh, and you'll hear that on... Um, 
those few old time radio shows that have uh, survived. But Dr. Watson at this point kind of, uh, um, uh, particularly through the way that Petri Wine portrayed this kind of a grandfatherly uh, figure, um, I, I thought this one was a, was a pretty clever plot um, with an interesting premise, and, and they did a good job on it. Um, I did kind of get a little feel of what Juni was talking about with with perhaps the end ad was uh, the Petri Wine theme song. Uh, I don't know how many more weeks uh, I'm going to be uh, lacking that, but I like the applause after the uh, song, so I guess that leaves me uh, uh, leaves us in, on the cusp of a dilemma if we want to to take that uh, to take that out. So. Um, one thing uh, about the show, because of the ads and the format of the the framing, uh, there's not as much uh, show uh, left to actually work with. Uh, like if you take Johnny Dollar, they've got 26, 27 minutes to work with at this point uh, because it's uh, it was a CBS sustained. Um, but uh, the Sherlock Holmes in 1945 with the Petri wine ads really had, um, uh, th- there was one episode I, I played, I believe it was the um, Superfluous Pearl uh, that actually didn't have any ads, in the, uh, and it was just the story, no intro, no outro, and it was only about 20 minutes long. So that's kind of a challenge they deal with, and I think they handled it pretty good this week. All right, well, if you got any comments, send it to me, box13 at greatdetectors.net. Uh, please uh, cast your vote for the show on Podcast Alley. We'll see you tomorrow with yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Uh, but from Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham, signing off.